in Matthew 15, in what way did the woman of Canaan worship the Lord? On what basis or by what mechanism did he grant the request he previously denied? So the question is in Matthew 15, how did the woman of Canaan worship the Lord? And why did he grant the request later that he originally refused? So let's look at Matthew 15 and we'll start in verse 22. Matthew 15, 22. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. So let's notice what's going on here. The woman clearly recognizes Jesus Christ as the Lord because she, she calls him that. She also recognizes him as the son of David. So she seems to clearly understand that he's the Messiah, that he's the son of God. Look at verse 23. But he answered her, not a word. So obviously he didn't grant her request, even though she clearly knows that he's the Lord. So she knows who he is. But he answered her not a word, and his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So the Lord gives the explanation that he can't help her because he's not sent to Gentiles. He's only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Verse 25, Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. So let's look at, uh, let's take a look at the word worship. And so we're going to pull up here the 1828 dictionary. We're going to pull up worship, and we're going to look at the verb form here. So <clears throat> worship, the first meaning is to adore, <coughs> to pay divine honors to, to reverence with supreme respect and veneration. And so that's the idea of what worship means. But I want to show you that Scripture seems to give it uh, an additional sense. And so what I'm going to do, let's run in the Blue Letter Bible, we're going to run the word worship, and we're going to hit return. And you can see there, uh, there's 198 different occurrences of worship. And we could go through all 198, but I'm going to cut to the chase here. And I'm going to run the word worship with bow, okay? And <clears throat> let's just look at a couple of these and maybe you'll get the sense here. And the man bowed down his head and worshiped the Lord. Genesis 24, 48. And I bowed down my head and worshiped the Lord. Genesis 24, 52. He worshiped the Lord, bowing himself to the earth. Exodus 4, 31. Then they bowed their heads and worshiped. Exodus 12, 27. And the people bowed the head and worshiped. There's other ones like this. But what I'm going to suggest to you is, in Scripture, what is worship frequently connected with? And it's obviously frequently connected with bowing down the head. And it's the idea of, it's an, it's an act of humility is what it is. So in Matthew 15, 25, let's go back there. Then came she and worshiped him saying, Lord, help me. So obviously the woman asks the Lord again for help. When it says she worshiped him, I think it's, it's having the sense of she's bowing down and acknowledging him as Lord. That's, that's my sense of what's going on there. Now notice verse 26. But he answered and said, it is not meat to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. So she's acknowledged him as Lord. She's acknowledged him as the son of David. She's bowed down and worshiped him. She's done all of that. And the Lord still says, it is not meat to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. And what the Lord is obviously saying there is he can't give the blessings that belong to Israel to Gentiles. The children are obviously the children of Israel. The dogs are obviously Gentiles. The Lord says, I cannot, it is not proper for me 
under the arrangements that God the Father has made with humanity. It's not proper for me to take the blessings that belong to someone else, Israel, and to cast it to dogs. Look at me at Ephesians 2, verse 11. The Lord says that because it is the doctrinal manner in which God was dealing with the earth at that time. Ephesians 2, verse 11. Wherefore remember that ye being in time past, Gentiles in the flesh. So this is about time past, before the dispensation of grace. Who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. That at that time, so at that time would include Matthew 15, obviously. It's prior to the dispensation of grace. That at that time ye were, now notice this, without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, notice this, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. When it says they're strangers from the covenants of promise, what it's indicating is throughout the Old Testament, God made various covenants with the nation of Israel. What did those covenants with the nation of Israel accomplish for Gentiles? And the answer is nothing because they were strangers from the covenants. To state the obvious, when your next door neighbor wins the lottery, you don't get anything typically. Why? Because you're a stranger from that contract that the, the neighbor bought the lottery ticket. So in time past, Gentiles cannot be blessed, which is why if you're living in time past and you are a Gentile, what is the first thing you should do? Stop being a Gentile, right? Esther 8, 17 refers to many people of the land became Jews. Now get with me verse 27, Matthew 15, 27. So go back to Matthew 15. And she said, truth, Lord. So she acknowledges the truth of what was just said in verse 26. She then says this, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. What's happening in verse 27 is the woman acknowledges that she cannot receive direct blessing from the Lord. As a dog, she can't have the children's food, but what can she have? The crumbs that fall from the master's table. So what she's saying is, no, you can't bless me directly, but you can bless me through Israel. In fact, in Genesis 12, doesn't God tell Abraham, in the singular Abraham, shall all nations of the earth be blessed? God always intended to bless the Gentiles, but it was through Israel. It was not directly to Gentiles under the covenants. In fact, oh, so I quoted that. Look, look, look at me at Genesis 12, verse 1. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Genesis 12, 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Get with me Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. Now in Luke 7, we see the Lord dealing with a different Gentile during his earthly ministry. And this is the, um, the centurion. So Romans, or excuse me, Luke chapter 7, and we'll look at verse 2. And a certain centurion's servant, who was dear unto him, was sick and ready to die. And when he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying that he was worthy for whom he should do this. For he loveth our nation, and he hath built us 
a synagogue. Notice what the Roman centurion does in Luke 7. Does he directly go to the Lord and say, Lord, I need your help with this? He doesn't. He goes to the elders of the Jews and asks them to, to seek the Lord on his behalf and to, to ask that his servant be healed. It's the, it's the same concept again. It's the blessing of Gentiles through the channel of Israel. Go back to Matthew 15 and we'll look at verse 28. Matthew chapter 15, verse 28. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Now notice a couple things. When he says that her faith is great, she knew from the very beginning that he was the Lord and the son of David because she said that in verse 22. So when he says great is thy faith, I don't think he's talking about her knowing that he's the Lord because she knew that all the way in verse 22. When he says, great is thy faith, I think he's making an observation as to her understanding. She has understanding that in time past, the way that a Gentile obtains blessing is through Israel. And when she, she acknowledges that, that she can't receive the blessings directly, but she can receive them through Israel, he immediately grants the request before he denied it. But when you read verse 28, and her daughter was made whole that very hour. So the Lord wasn't stalling, he wasn't being obstinate, but he was not going to violate the covenants that God the Father had put in place. He was going to wait until the woman of Canaan made the approach that was proper under the covenants that God the Father had put in place. So on what basis or by what mechanism did the Lord grant the request he previously denied? Well, the woman of Canaan first approached the Lord directly and not through Israel. Well, that was contrary to the way things worked in time past. So the Lord could not bless her in that disobedient approach. Even though she knew who he was, the Lord and the son of David, her approach directly to him was disobedient under that economy. The Lord says that the, he says to the disciples that he is not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, when he says that, I think what he's telling them is they should intercede on her behalf. Isn't that what happened in Luke 7? The Roman centurion goes to the elders of the Jews, and the elders of the Jews approach the Lord, and the Lord grants the request. Well, when, when Jesus says to the disciples, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. They should understand for that Gentile woman to obtain a blessing, she needs to go through Israel and they should act on her behalf to present her request to him. Of course, they don't do that. But when the woman of Canaan finally acknowledges that she cannot be blessed except through Israel, the Lord grants her request. Next question. Can you speak on how the disciples had the scriptures from the prophets, but still did not understand the death, burial, and resurrection. It seems odd that they would not be expecting that to happen. So what the question goes to is, the disciples have the Old Testament, they have the scriptures available to them. The scriptures speak of the Lord's death, burial, and resurrection. So why didn't they get it? Get 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 10. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 10. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify, when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. What I'm going to suggest to you is that prophets would often write scriptures without fully understanding them. And of course, you know this has to be true. When, when a human writer of scripture, 
when they write the words on the page, do they have total understanding of what they write? And they don't. They may have some, but they don't have complete understanding of everything that they write because they're, they're only human. So it, it's, it's often the case that prophets write things and they don't have complete understanding of what they write. Of course, who is the true author of Scripture? The Holy Spirit. The human vessels are used to record it. Look at me at John 20, verse 9. John chapter 20, verse 9. Now in John 20, this is obviously after the cross. It's after the burial and it's, and it's after the resurrection. Look at John 20, verse 9. For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. What's often the case is we look back on things and we say, oh, this is so easy. How did they not get it? And that's because hindsight is 2020. But when you're in the moment of things, there's often things you don't understand. John 20, verse 9, even though the Lord specifically says during his earthly ministry, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. When he says that, what do people immediately think? Well, how are you going to rebuild the temple building? And they don't even get what he's saying. Well, just as the prophets or just as the disciples had things they didn't understand in the Old Testament, we should sort of have the recognition that there are a lot of scriptures written to us today that we don't understand very well, right? And so we're sort of about the same as they were. There's things that have been written that we ought to understand better and we, we just don't. And that's because we're, you know, we're just not as spiritually discerning. We don't study enough. You, you, you get the issue. Uh, look with me at Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 14. Hebrews 5, 14. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age. Now notice this. Even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Now, a mature saint should be consuming strong meat. You know, they should be consuming doctrine and, and adding understanding to their soul. And what Hebrews 5.14 is talking about there, who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. If you want to build a muscle, what do you have to do? You have to use it, right? If you, any muscle you want to build, you have to use. So what we need to do with our spiritual senses is we need to exercise them. We need to use them again and again and again. And those give us the ability to what it says here, to discern both good and evil. You can decide whether or not this is true. My contention is that the body of Christ and certainly the church at large has very little ability of discernment. And the reason I think that's the case is that the body of Christ believes all manner of crazy things. It's carried away with unsound doctrines and has little ability to discern things because they haven't used their spiritual senses. They haven't developed those muscles to discern be between good and evil. The Word of God is understandable through the Holy Spirit, but we will not understand it if we don't study. People sometimes have the idea, you may have heard this, well, I'm never closer to God than when I'm out in nature. You know, I'm never closer to God than when I'm in my boat fishing. <coughs> well, God is ever present, right? God lives everywhere. You don't have to go find him somewhere. But what happens is people are talking about some sort of experiential thing that, they're, they, you know, that the, their senses are perceiving. The way that it works is the way that God communicates with us today is through his word. Every word is carefully chosen. I've given you this example before, but if you think about an encyclopedia, an encyclopedia groups all the knowledge on a subject in the same entry, right? So if you want to read about 
President Lincoln. There's an entry that has all the information about his life. Well, what God did with the scripture, if you wanted to learn everything about the rapture, can you go to a single chapter and just read there? You can't. You just can't. You have to study 1 Corinthians 15. You have to study 1 Thessalonians 4. And there's other, if you don't study all of those passages, you won't have a complete picture. What that means is God intentionally designed his word that for you to study it properly and for you to come to understanding, it's not like you read a chapter on the rapture and you're like, I got it. I'm done. It doesn't work that way at all. You have to read all of these passages together and you have to read them again and again and again and you have to compare verse with verse and that's the way you come to understanding. And, and, and the failure of the body of Christ to do that is why the body of Christ is in such confusion. In Acts 17, the, the, the Bereans that were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and here's what they did, they searched the scriptures daily. So the frequency was how often? Daily. And when it says they searched, searching is harder than glancing. It's harder than reading or skimming. You know how it is when you search for something. Have you ever lost something? Well, it, it takes, it's effort, right? It's effort. It's time. It's intentionality. You see the point? Well, when they're searching the scriptures daily, they're having a very intense look at the scriptures that's allowing them to to, to, to grow in understanding. That's the idea.